Heavenly Father, it's a wonderful day you have given unto us. And uh, we really need an experience with you. The Lord, all the things of this earth may look dim compared to the things of heaven which are eternal. And so as we tap into understanding uh, your will upon our lives, we pray that heaven may be open and the windows of heaven may be open. We may be ministered unto that uh, thy spirit, Lord, through the agencies that you have anointed yourself, may, Lord, be imparted uh, upon us. And me as a speaker, Lord, use me as a weak vessel. And those who shall be listening, Lord, open their spiritual ears that they may behold the wondrous things that you want to reveal through your word. And so guide us in this moment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so uh, I just want to thank the Lord that uh, he is doing everything that he can do to be able to open our eyes so that uh, we may not be left with a, a shadow of doubt that uh, all heaven is on our side to make sure that a generation uh, that has been chosen for a, such a special time as this may stand and be counted upon, not as if that uh, heaven has failed, but uh, that uh, God is wanting to vindicate the character uh, um, of his government in the whole universe. And so today, uh, I know that uh, such a series cannot um, uh, be completed without uh, looking into the issue of uh, justification by faith. But um, as it were, we are just laying ground for uh, the people to go and be able to study if these things be so. And so today I'll be touching a little bit uh, on that issue, not much deeply as it should be, but um, just uh, giving some uh, 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 tidbits about it so that we may go ahead and study it ourselves. And um, I want mostly to dwell on uh, justification experience. Someone may ask, what is justification experience? Actually, justification is a two or a threefold word. And um, the first one is justification declared, what actually we always understand as justification. And then we have what we call sanctification. Actual sanctification is what we call justification experienced, justification experienced. And then uh, uh, um, what you call glorification is uh, uh, justification completed. And so I'll just go on to justification experience and uh, I'll be in the book of Romans chapter five. If you can have your Bible and uh, be able to look in the book of Romans chapter five, that is where actually my discourse mostly is. And so um, Paul actually in the fifth chapter of Romans shows us where the true experience of the child of God uh, begins. You can look at the book of Romans chapter one, where actually we are told about the gospel, uh, which is the power of God unto salvation and the just shall live by faith. And then uh, you go to the book of Romans chapter two, which talks about who is a, a Jew actually. Um, uh, is it by circumcision is, or a, a true Jew is a, a circumcision of, is it by uh, just dwelling in Israel that you become a true Jew or it is the circumcision of the heart? Then uh, when you come to Romans chapter three, it talks about the glory that has been lost. And then uh, 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 in Romans chapter four, now he's speaking about Abraham and all uh, that it entails to be the children of Abraham. When you reach in the book of uh, Romans chapter 5, now Paul starts this nitty gritty about um, what actually justification or sanctification will bring into our life. Not only does God declare justification, but also he gives the experience. And um, in theological terms, technical time, uh, terms, actually, justification declared also is what you, you, you call um, uh, um, imputed righteousness, imputed righteousness. Then justification experienced is what you call um, 
uh, uh, um, imparted righteousness where actually the Holy Spirit sanctifies you and makes you a new person. We are talking about the last generation and justification experience. We need to have a living connection with God ourselves in order to teach about Jesus because you can teach about Jesus if you haven't had a living connection with him. Uh, in the book of John, uh, I'll just go straight away in the book of John as uh, I'll be coming back to the book of uh, Romans chapter 5. John chapter 20 and um, uh, verse uh, 22. John chapter 20 verses 22. This is what we read in the word of God. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why should I, uh, uh, I really read about this? Because uh, in John chapter 3, verses 34, we find that uh, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. So, if we will go and teach about Jesus Christ, we need the breath of life in our own life. And then we need, if we will speak the words of God, then we must have the spirit of God without measure. And uh, it is the Father's will that we may have the fullness of the Godhead also in us so that uh, we may be able to proclaim that which uh, we have uh, experienced. And so, um, uh, I want to say that um, uh, we need to have a living connection with God ourselves in order to teach Jesus. Then we can give the living personal experience of what Christ is uh, to us by experience and faith. Um, you know, when once when Christ breathed on the disciples, it went, the words went with the divine power that had to impart on them the divine nature after escaping the corruption and the pollutions that are in this world. And so when uh, Christ breathes upon us, actually what he's breathing upon us, it is his efficacious power, the life of his soul, so that he may be able to send us, even as his father sent him to come and accomplish something so special on this earth and then qualify to be the high priest in heaven. So as he breathes on, on us, he gives us his own experience. In uh, Hebrews chapter nine, verse 14, we are told that when he breathes upon us by giving this eternal spirit, actually he purges our conscience that um, we may be purified and not continue to serve dead works, but uh, uh, be living episodes. Uh, uh, in this uh, world that we are dwelling in. And so we need that experience so that we may teach the Christ we know of. John says that which we have touched, that which we have felt, we declare unto you. And so we cannot go about declaring about Jesus Christ whom we don't have a living connection with. We have received Christ and with divine earnestness, we can tell that which is in abiding power with us. The people must be drawn to Christ. And um, the prominent actually has to be his efficacious power, not just by words, but by our lives. In that uh, uh, our lives are living summons to those uh, who are being preached to. And so... Therefore, being justified by faith, let us go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, and uh, see what um, we are told. The book of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We are told, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are talking about um, uh, this uh, justification, that um, the word therefore, actually there uh, in the book of Romans chapter five, verse one, is talking about what Paul has been saying from chapter one to chapter four, and uh, talking how about people are justified and how they have to live. And so when he starts the fifth chapter with the word therefore, we need to understand that he is linking the 
preceding chapters with the fifth and you can read chapter one chapter two chapter three and chapter four and see what actually it's saying so therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ now we looked at this uh, word justification or justify but what does it mean just to repeat the word justified actually means to prove or to show to be just to declare somebody to be something and so um, what is God declaring us to be? You remember that uh, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, we read that the sanctuary shall be cleansed or the sanctuary shall be justified. The sanctuary shall be restored in its rightful place or the sanctuary shall be vindicated. And so when Christ justifies us, what he is doing is the restoration to humanity, the glory that he lost when he sinned in the Garden of Eden. And so this justification brings us back to the conformity of his government, makes us to be able to choose that which is right from wrong and follow that which is right. He looks at us once again as a people who belongs to him and not a people who are alienated to him. And justification is to make one right. It is to uh, 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 put him in a place or put something in a place that it can serve for the purpose that uh, it should serve. It is some... Um, and. Uh, it's part of the sanctification when we are talking about justification experience and that is setting apart so that it may be used for what it was uh, purpose to be used. But what was the original plan of God? Maybe we can remind ourselves what was the original plan of God in the book of uh, Genesis chapter one. I want us to see this Genesis chapter one verses um, uh, 26. Uh, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fall of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so God created man that he should bear his image and his likeness. But then sin came and man was alienated. And so God is looking at the people in the end time who shall receive justification and who shall receive, uh, have this experience of sanctification and be able to be restored unto the image of God and unto his likeness. When you continue to read the book of uh, Genesis chapter 1, um, look at uh, verse uh, 29, not verse 29, I'll, uh, I'll go a little bit um, early, Genesis chapter 1, and uh, verses uh, Uh, just do this Genesis chapter 1 and this is uh, verse, um, verse 11 and God said let the earth bring forth grass the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, what does this have to do with justification? This is it, that uh, every seed has to reproduce its own kind. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, we are told that whoever is born of God doth not continue to sin because the seed of he who has born him remaineth in him and he cannot sin. When you read Galatians 3, 16 says that unto the seed he spoke, not as many seeds, but seed that is Christ. And so if the seed of Christ remains in us, then 
what we can produce, it is of the same kind. This is the generation that Lord, the, the Lord of heaven is looking at, that they shall have the seed of his son. And then the original plan, which was to uh, man to bear the image and the likeness of God shall be accomplished if they are having the indwelling seed of Jesus Christ in them. And so this is the work of justification that it may reproduce a faith that is of the same kind of the father and of the son. And what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can read that in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, how does this faith come? In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we are told that faith, so then faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Faith is the expectation that the word of God will do what that word says and depending upon that word only to do what it says. It, it doesn't give you many options. Faith doesn't give you many options. Faith is just a belief in that thing that what you believe in shall do what you believe and depending on that thing to reproduce that which you believe it will reproduce. And so by the indwelling power of the word of God, and we are told in um, John chapter 6 verse 63 that uh, uh, um, the, 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 the flesh profited nothing but um, uh, uh, the spirit quickened. The one that I speak unto you, it is spirit and it is life. So the germinating principle enfolded in the word of God, which is the seed, has to reproduce the spirit of Christ in us or the fruit of the spirit, uh, the, the, the fruit of the spirit in us. That um, when we receive that word by faith, the germinating principle takes hold of our hearts and then we can reproduce of the same kind. Look at this in the book of John chapter one, again, the book of John chapter one. John chapter one, and we want to look at this word. We are told that um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so Jesus Christ is the word of God. And that word, we are told, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So if anyone is having this seed, this word who is Christ, actually, the life of Christ will be given to this person and that life will be the light. And when a person walks in the light, they will never stumble because thy word is a light unto my path and um, uh, um, the, thy word is a light unto my path. Uh, so the psalmist says in uh, Psalms 119, uh, uh, and if we have this word, we will grow into a perfect man. Uh, let us see in Psalms 119, Psalms 119, and uh, we are told that um, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We are looking at the issue justification experience that the people who have received justification in this last generation, what is Christ expecting of them? That um, they were created, man was created in the image of God, but he lost that image. And what God is expecting this last generation is that word to be reproduced in them, the likeness and the image of God may be reproduced in them. So faith is the expecting of the word of God to do what the word says and depending upon that word only to do what it says. And so um, you can see that um, when God speaks his word, it doesn't go just like that. In the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 55 verse 10 uh, to 11, the book of uh, Isaiah 55, 
Isaiah 55 verses 10, we read this. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where to I send it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the mitle tree, and it shall be the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Look at those words that also appears in the book of Revelation chapter 14 verse 1 and the book of uh, Revelation chapter 3, that it shall be to the Lord for a name. And you understand the 144, the last generation, actually, they are having the father's name in their forehead and they are pillars in the temple of God and they have this, uh, uh, the, the name of the son, the new name of the son in their forehead. And this we are told it will be for an everlasting sign. What produces such a, a state in these people? It is having the faith of Jesus Christ. We are told that they have been justified and the Lord has spoken his word in their lives. And that word is doing an efficacious work in that they become just as God he is in his likeness and in his image. And his image is um, restored in, in them. His image actually is um, restored in him. For, so we are told that this word is like uh, a rain that when God speaks of it, it will accomplish that which actually he has purposed to accomplish. In the book of Psalms, that verse 6, we are told by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And so this word will bring a recreation to all who take it by faith. For by him, Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is seeking that um, that image that was lost may be restored in the final generation so that they may be able to join the heavenly family. This thought is also echoed uh, in the book of Colossians. Um, the book of Colossians, and uh, that is uh, verses 20, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20. Here we read that God is in the business of reconciling everything so that we may be one family. Colossians 1, 20, it says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or in heaven. That uh, what God is seeking is to reconcile everything, whether they be on earth uh, or in heaven. And uh, I know we are told that... Um, uh, he may make the things on earth and in heaven one reconcile the things in heaven and earth to be one. Actually, that is uh, what God is doing. And uh, in order for us to dwell with the heavenly family, then we must be in the state that the heavenly family is, and it is in the sinless state. And so, uh, in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where we read, therefore, being justified by faith, then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it is interesting that uh, a person who is a sinner cannot have peace. A person who is a sinner cannot have peace, and Christ promised peace in John chapter 14, verse 27. We are told that 
my peace I give unto you, not like the world giveth unto you, give I my own peace. And then uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, we are told that uh, he will give him perfect peace, he whose heart is um, uh, 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 given unto him, actually. And so being justified, then we have peace with God. And this is the work that Christ has been doing. What is that work? To make the human family be at peace with the heavenly family or the earthly family to be at peace with the heavenly family. If we are not at peace with God, then we are at war with him. But I also want to re-echo something that was spoken in Isaiah chapter 55, that uh, instead of the thorns and the briars, we shall have these trees which are fruitful. When man came or entered into sin in Genesis chapter 3, all that followed man was a curse. But then we see in Isaiah chapter 55 when the word of God is spoken to his people and they are restored, what actually follows is uh, trees which are fruitful and not only trees, trees which are uh, fruitful, but actually these trees that um, are, um, they have fragrance that actually bringeth peace in the heart of uh, 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 a human being. And uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.16, we are told that now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. And this peace we are seeing in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where we are dealing with justification experience, that uh, it is only those who are justified that uh, actually um, have peace. In, in Ministry of Healing, page 247, paragraph one, we, we are told that uh, this peace is not something that can come in the life of a Christian without Christ himself. In fact, uh, I, I like to go there so that uh, I may not um, paraphrase it. Ministry of Healing 247.1. Ministry of Healing, that is MH 247.1. This abiding peace. We read that uh, abiding peace, the true rest of spirit, has but one source. It was of this that Christ spoke when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Matthew 11 28. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the word giveth, give I unto you. John 14 27. This peace is not something that he gives apart from himself. It is in Christ and we can receive it only by receiving him. And so we find that uh, the people who are justified have the indwelling power of Jesus Christ and then they are reconciled unto him and now they are at peace. They are ready to meet their Lord because they do not have anything in them that actually Satan can, uh, uh, can point at and then say that these are still mine. Now, when the Savior imparts his peace to the soul, the heart will be in perfect harmony with the word of God for the spirit and the word agree. That is what the Bible tells us. And so we cannot say that we are experiencing justification and be, then be at war with the word. Because in justification, the spirit is given unto us without measure. The Lord is pleased to give us his fullness and his fullness is the giving of his spirit, which has not only the fruits, but also according to Ephesians chapter 4, it has the gifts. The reason also we are not seeing that the church is having the gifts is because the church has not come to a point that it has accepted the spirit of the Lord so that uh, it may impart on them the gifts of the spirit and they may be able to accomplish the work. There is still a dilly darling in this or in that. People have not experienced the power of Christ in their lives and have no power to be able to resist sin.
And so we are looking at justification experienced, and this justification experience is the spirit given unto us without measure, and then the spirit and the word agree. So when Christ imparts his spirit, then we shall see a people who are not only having the fruit of the spirit, but they are also exhibiting the, uh, the, the, the gift of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit will be accompanied by the fruit of the spirit. The peace that Christ gave to his disciples and for which we pray is the peace that is born of truth a peace that is not to be quenched because of division. This peace is not the peace that comes through conformity to the world. Christ never purchased peace by compromise with evil. And so we are seeing that uh, justification will produce such a condition according to Romans chapter five, verse one, that uh, being justified, we shall have this peace. And we are seeing that this peace is the indwelling power of the, uh, uh, um, of the spirit and the word of God being assimilated in our lives so that uh, we may not be moved. In uh, Psalms 119, 165, Psalms 119, 165. Uh, let me share this, just still looking at this issue of the last generation and justification experience. Psalms, uh, Psalms 119, 165, 165. Oh, sorry. Psalms 119, 165, we are told that uh, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, we were seeing in the last presentation that um, the last generation enters into the most holy place where it, there is the law of God. And the psalmist is telling us that uh, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. And so we shall see also the last generation which are justified, really exemplifying the law of God above everything. And it's not just, a, we saw that it's not just a legal law that we are talking about, but even also the spirit of the law. And so, in Isaiah 57, verse 21, we are told there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And so if we are saying that we are experiencing justification and then we are found without peace, we are found the way uh, in the way in the state that the wicked are in, then we can be sure that we are deceiving ourselves. In Romans chapter 5, verse 2, then the Bible says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace we are in, we stand and rejoice in hope of uh, the glory of God. We don't obtain this grace through our own works or because of anything good that we may have done. It is all through the love of Christ and by faith in Christ. And that is what keeps us from falling. What is this grace? It is very amazing what we are told grace is. Look at this in uh, ministry of healing. We are told grace is an attribute of God, exercised toward undeserving human beings. We did not seek for it, but it was sent in search for us. God rejoices to bestow his grace upon us. And so not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy, our only claim to his mercy is our great need. It is amazing that uh, God is seeking to give us one of his attributes, and that is grace. That power of omnipotence to be able to unlock everything and to be able to do everything, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so God is not only seeking a generation that can have his permissive will, but can have his perfect will, the perfect will that has his grace. 
which is his attribute, and grace is that enabling power that we do not deserve, that God will like to share with us. And Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. There is something that I get from the point in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that also this justification, which gives us peace and then gives us grace, will equip us with the powers to labor. No wonder we are told in uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. We are told, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with, the, with his glory. In Isaiah, 60, then verse 1, we are told, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So this grace equips us with the power to be able to sound the loud cry, the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 18. This is the last generation. And we are just looking at justification experienced as it's explained in uh, Romans chapter five. And so the people who are experiencing the grace of God, the peace of God, they will also love to labor for others who have not come to truth. And it will not just be a normal labor because this will be the work of the final hour and it will come with a lot of challenges and they need the glory of heaven, the power of heaven, the peace and the grace of heaven to accompany them, to abide in them so that they may do a work that no other generation has been able to do since the world began. because this is the message that separates the wheat from the tares. And so verse two of Romans chapter five, says, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We know that it is the last generation waiting for the glory of God. Psalms chapter 9 verse 4 says that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I rejoice in thy salvation. Again, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, talking about the experience of uh, the people who have received justification, verses 10 and 11, verses 10 and 11. We are just going through these familiar passages, but bringing them in the light of the final generation, what God is talking about, what is the experience of those who have received justification? Isaiah 61, verse 10, I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Verse 11 says, For as the earth bringeth forth her bud and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. We understand that uh, the fourth angels carries the messages of the first, the second, and the third angels message as they swell in the loud cry. And uh, in, in the first angels, we find that the gospel is all to the nations, to all tongues, and to the people. And so it is only when Christ clothes his people with justification or with the garments of salvation then they can go to all earth and preach the gospel as a witness, then the end shall come. And so we see the final generation which has been justified by God and experiencing just that justification, being clothed with the glory of God and going forward to all nations. There shall be no fear in them of what may happen as they go because 
they shall rejoice in the testimonies of God in their heart. The reproach of the world and the forces of the world and the afflictions of the world, we are told in Romans chapter 8 that cannot deem their view of the glory that shall be revealed in the future. And so they go on conquering to conquer as it were the first seal when it was broken. The same experience that uh, the apostles had will be repeated, but on a larger scale, and the work will not end with a lesser manifestation as it began, but it will end with a greater manifestation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation will be heard all over the four corners of the world. And those who sit in darkness, we are told, they shall come into this marvelous light. We are told that uh, at that time, we read in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, that God will put in us the word of reconciliation. Because Christ is ministering in the sanctuary above, and he is doing the work of reconciling the uh, world unto God. So the people who shall be living in the end time, they shall be priests for God. And they shall be given the ministry of reconciliation by the word of God. And so instead of um, walking in fear and uh, looking on their shoulders what they may be losing, as they do their work, this world will grow them unto them. They shall rejoice that the Lord has appointed these earthen vessels to be used uh, for the glory and the power of his majesty. Romans chapter 5 verses 3, we are told, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And uh, this really... Uh, uh, um, Excites me here is the patience of the saints here, they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So justification experienced also what it produces is the patience to go through tribulations. In fact, um, uh, I believe in the great controversy we are told that um, the last generation of the saints just living in the time of the image of the beast and the mark of the beast shall receive the Holy Spirit not only for preaching, but to make them go through the time of trouble as has never been. And so uh, uh, verse 3 says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patient. That is after being justified, as we are experiencing justification by faith through Jesus Christ, we have peace, we have the grace of God, and we also rejoice in the tribulation because actually it has reproduced patience in us. And so we look at justification and see that it is the catalyst of uh, making everything possible uh, in the lives of the people who shall be waiting for Jesus Christ. In John 16, 33, the book of John 16, 33, um, this is what uh, the word of God says, John 16, 33, just uh, we are told, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So if justification can give an, uh, a patient that the saints need, then uh, there is nothing that will make us fear what shall come upon the earth. I know that the great ordeal awaiting us is not what we may think of it. In fact, we have been told that um, uh, the great crisis is coming. Um, no pen can picture and write it vividly what it shall be. But then the greater the ordeal the greater the faith that God gives unto us, the greater the experience that we will have in Christ. And so we can be sure that the Lord can give us the patience that is needed for that time. And in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. 
Does God really rejoice in his children's suffering? No, there's something beautiful that um, um, we read in uh, John chapter 17 from verse 14. John 17 verses 14. Does God rejoice in uh, his children's suffering? John 17 verses 14. We are told, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So the reason why they are suffering is they are in the world, but they are not of the world. And so God has to come and take them. Uh, first of all, he has to take them uh, from the power of sin by sanctifying them, by justifying them. And when they experience justification, he has to take them from the presence of sin. And so the reason why they are suffering is because they are in the presence of sin, not because the power of sin has dominion over them, but because they are in the presence of sin. And being in the presence of sin does not make you a sinner because the power of sin is not over you or you are not under the dominion of sin. It is just because you find yourself in a place you don't, um, you, you, you are not fitting. And so Christ has to take the power of sin from us. And then when we come to the state that we don't belong to the world, he will come and take us from the world or the presence of uh, sin. Verse 15, he says, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And so you see those similarities that the children of God in the last generation, they shall be reflecting him in that uh, wildness will not be identified with them. They will have reached at a stature that Christ has to come and claim them as his own. And you see in these very verses that uh, actually, um, they will be preserved in this world to demonstrate the experience they have received in justification. Although there reaches a time that they do not have a heavenly intercessor, they will not be left without uh, a protector. They will be preserved from the time of trial. In fact, uh, I'm reminded of uh, Revelation. Um, Is it revelation, the hour of trial? Uh, this is um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the world. And so justification produces this patience, and this patience actually takes out the wildness in us, and then we are kept from the hour of temptation, and then Christ can come and uh, uh, um, claim us as his own. We continue in the book of uh, Romans chapter 5 as um, uh we bring this to an end. In the book of Romans chapter five, verse four, let us go there, Romans chapter five, verses four. Romans five, verses four, we are told, and patience, experience, and experience hope. Very interesting. If you read these just verses connected together, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with um, God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace we are in we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. What is this as uh, we bring in this last thoughts that um, and patient experience and experience hope justification experienced brings in experience the experience is gained by 
patiently withstanding the tribulation trials and temptation that always come upon us. This is only possible through Jesus Christ dwelling in us by faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, you may not be moved by anything. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17. Think about this. Why is this so much important about the last generation? God could have demonstrated this with Adam. But remember one thing about Adam, that um, Adam, after sinning, he still had that vital power because he was partaking of uh, the tree of life before he sinned. And so that vitality was still there. And God could have used him, but the demonstration and the experience could have not been like the experience of the people living in the last days. The people living in the last days, starting from their physical stature, going to all the things that pertains to them, it has been deteriorated by almost 6,000 years of sin. And so God is going to take the weakest thing of all, the weakest of the weakest, and then reproduce his own likeness and his image, and then tell Satan, can you see the generation that will defeat you? And we saw that even as Job was a representative of the 144, God will be able, as he asks us, have you seen Job, my servant? He shall be able to pose this question once again to Satan in the end time. Have you seen the people on the face of the earth? And then, Satan will go about in fury knowing that he has lost everything, trying to finish them with fury. But the weakest of the weakest, deteriorated by 6,000 years of sin, will be able to stand against the accusations of Satan that no one can bear the likeness of God and his image in this sinful world. The question that uh, we have to ask ourselves, do we believe that we can have this experience? In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, we are told, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world begin. Do we believe that uh, as God has said that there will be a people who shall be the last jury upon the face of earth that will stand for me and have eternal life? If we are given that chance and God is giving us that chance, will we stand the test of the time? And if we examine ourselves this point and find that uh, we cannot or we are not, I, I use the word we are not standing as we should be standing. The question is, what is it that is preventing us? Is in the grace of God sufficient to reproduce that which he has said in his word? God do not lie. And that thing which has gone out of the mouth of the Lord shall not return thither without the fruit. As um, I read this, we are told uh, in uh, Christ Object Lesson, page um, 332, paragraph 3. A character formed according to the divine likeness is the only treasure that we can take from this world to the next. Those who are under the instruction of Christ in this world will take every divine attain attainment with them to the heavenly mansions. And in heaven, we are continually to improve. How important then is the development of character in this life? Is there anything that we can say the heavens have withheld from us? Hope maketh us not to be ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Hope will not make us to be embarrassed. When the character of God is reproduced in all in us, actually, we can be able to stand with that character that cannot be effaced by anything else. And so my prayer for me and for you that uh, after all has been said about this generation, Will we accept 
the promises of the word of God to be fulfilled in us? Or will we continue to doubt that which have been spoken about us? And as we keep doubting, don't we have a multitude of weakness? In Hebrews chapter 11, who have gone before us, yet they were in the other apartments of the sanctuary, but we have come in the very presence of God and his glory, his likeness and his image, as long as we remain in his presence, the rules of adaptation will work in our life that we shall be that which we behold. I end this in the book of um, uh, Second Corinthians, the book of um, Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three, and um, we are told this. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty can only be spoken of with those people who have received freedom from sin. The people who have been justified and are experiencing just that justification. And so we are told, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. I pray that uh, we may fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. And as we continue fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, then we are told that uh, we shall have that uh, same image. We need again to have a living connection with the God, with God ourselves, in order to teach others about Jesus then we can give the living personal experience of what Christ is to us by experience and faith. We have received Christ and with divine earnestness, we can tell that which is in abiding power with and within us, the people must be drawn to Christ. No wonder God gave a most precious message to elders Wagoner and Jonas. It was to uplift our savior that people may receive this rich gift and they may be pointed to his divine nature by being pointed unto it, they may partake of the same after escaping the corruption that is in this world. This is the message that the Lord gave, the message of justification by faith. And this is the message that has to be not proclaimed only, but experienced by the last generation. May the Lord bless us as we contemplate upon these things and as we meditate upon them, that we shall take a thoughtful hour to think about uh, what we have learned in the life of Jesus Christ. And as we do this, we are told that we are turned from glory to glory. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we uh, pray? Our Heavenly Father, through the merits of thy Son, we can be able to come boldly before thy throne of grace in time of need that we may gain the help that we need. And Father, there is no day that you have turned away a contrite heart and a penitent spirit. We pray that uh, you may help us, Lord, to be penitent, and you may help us to be contrite that we may be acceptable in thy sight. Not for our own sake, but for vindicating thy character as we live in these last days of the earthly history. And so thank you for your children that uh, are agonizing and praying that they may have this experience of justification. Bless us and continue speaking to us individually as a church and as a family. In the precious name of thy son, we ask these things. Amen. Uh, may the Lord of heaven bless you and uh, continue enriching you in your daily experience with him. And uh, God be, be with you. Blessings all.